century ago, or two centuries ago, the people who came here from abroad were actually very similar to those coming here today. Okay. They're coming from rural areas, small towns, from countries that were um, not very developed. Uh, and they're the same kinds of people, in a sense. They're usually not the poorest of the poor. They're one step up from that. People with a little get up and go, because it's a big deal even today to you know, leave your country and go somewhere else. Right. What's changed, though, is us. Modernity over the past century has affected changes that are so fundamental that our entire situation has changed. First of all, we live in a post-industrial knowledge-based economy. Mm -hmm. um, we now have a uh, welfare state, not even just a welfare state, but a large government sector in all respects. The government now spends a third or more of national income, schools, roads, everything as well as welfare and, and, and such like communications and transportation technology has shrunk the world, which again is a good thing uh, in a lot of ways, clearly, but makes the uh, equation for assimilation and for security very different from anything in the past. Likewise, in modern societies, the elites lose a lot of the cultural self-confidence necessary uh, that we saw a hundred years ago that successfully got immigrants to become more like us rather than them, us like them. And so the point is we've basically outgrown immigration in a whole variety of ways and it's something that worked for us before and it just doesn't work now. Uh, another aspect, a less desirable aspect of modern society where the elites in modern societies lose the cultural self-confidence. And My mother went to Medford, Massachusetts public schools outside Boston and the implicit deal my parents, I mean, my grandparents bringing my mother to school were saying, you teach our daughter what it is to be an American. She memorized the Gettysburg Address, sang Hail Columbia, and learned George Washington was the father of our country. This is not what kids are learning in the L.A. Unified School District or New York Public Schools or elsewhere. And it's not because the immigrants or the immigrant kids are different. It's because they are coming into a very different context where American elites no longer accept the value of our history and our past and no longer teach it in such a way that would get immigrants to want to be part of it. That assimilation isn't just getting a job, learning English and driving on the right side of the road. It's a, it's a kind of psychological or emotional process where you shift your emotional attachments and your fundamental allegiances from one people to another. And that's the kind of thing that we simply are in a modern society much less able to do and we create essentially post-American immigrants. We have a post-American elite that is, not, and again, this isn't all immigrants, but there's a difference here. Our own children have a, have a personal family history in America. And when they come to the point of thinking about identity, America is what it is there for them. Immigrant kids have something else from their parents. It's not natural to cultivate this sense of peoplehood in someone who, is, who doesn't naturally have it. It's a much more difficult thing to do. And actually, there's survey data that suggests this. I didn't have it when the book came out, mm -hmm. that naturalized Americans, have um, naturalized citizens, have much less attachment to the United States than native-born citizens. There's a whole variety of uh, um, you know, questions that were asked, and they, all, they were all very clear in that direction. Immigration is a government program that we need to shape in such a way as that it serves the interest of the United States. When you're taking in into a modern society like ours, a post-industrial society, 19th century immigrants into a 21st century society, it just doesn't work very well. Now, it's not that they're not going to be able to eat. Obviously, immigrants come here to work and they do get work. Right. They also increase the size of the economy. There's no question about it. Right. They derive though most of the benefit from that increased size of the economy. In other words, they create more economic output but they almost they, 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 they have a bigger piece of the pie. They eat the whole bigger piece of the pie. In a modern society, these are the very kinds of people who are um, designed to be consumers of tax revenues, of government services, because they are the, they're unskilled people who have families, the working poor with families. Our welfare system is designed to subsidize the working poor with families. And that's a whole separate argument about whether that's mm -hmm. a good thing or not, but mm -hmm. that's what it is. And we're importing more people for whom our welfare system is precisely designed to subsidize. There is a net, a very small net economic benefit caused by immigration. What happens is immigrants 
push down the wages of lower skilled Americans. And that economic benefit is then spread across the other 90% of society. Essentially, the poor see a 5% drop in their income. Everybody else sees a two-tenths of a percent increase in their income, their effective earnings. Right. So it's kind of a moral question. Is it right to beggar the poor for the benefit of everybody else? Uh, it's a redistributionistic effect. Um, we have a greater obligation to our fellow Americans than we do to foreigners. That is a moral statement. It's not, mm -hmm. a, it's not a factual statement in some sense. In other words, you can disagree with that. And I, there are a lot of people who do. The Wall Street Journal, I have to say, uh, disagrees with that, doesn't see the, uh, what one philosopher calls concentric circles of obligation, where right. you know, your own family is most important to you, your countrymen, and then humanity as a whole. We have to have priorities. And there are going to be those who say impoverishing American poor people a little bit is worth the increase in income, the significant increase in income that an immigrant would experience coming from, say, Central America. Right. My answer is no. I mean, this is a political question, and I, my contention is I have a greater obligation to my fellow countrymen than to foreigners. Modern technology means that you can go home for your cousin's wedding and then come back for work, uh, you know, at the end of the, you know, when the, the next week. That you can send your kids, uh, you know, back home for a summer with the old in the old country, you didn't, you couldn't do that in the old days. You know, obviously, you have to take a boat back. You have to, to take a boat. It could take months. It was expensive. I mean, right. some people did it, but it was right. much more difficult. What transnationalism really means is the ability of even ordinary people to live with a, a foot in each country, kind of live in two countries at the same time, and that is, it's not a bad thing to want to maintain your connection with the old country. It's, it's a normal human impulse. If you can, in fact, go home for your aunt's wedding and come back the next week, there isn't the same reason to have to pull up your roots and go back home all over again. In other words, transnationalism may well make return migration less compelling for a lot of immigrants. That's not a good sign in my perspective because um, you end up with transnationalism. In other words, you end up with people uh, less committed and less rooted. Um, what we need to do is minimize legal immigration to the degree possible. And because there are other values that we may want to preserve, we may want to let immigrants in, certain immigrants, despite the problems that immigration can create. In other words, a kind of zero-based budgeting in immigration, you build up from zero. Right. Three, all immigration flows have three components, family, skills, and humanitarian. For family, nuclear family only husbands, wives, little kids of U.S. citizens. Anything beyond that I find difficult to rationalize. That's still a lot of people, though. That could be 300,000 people a year. All right. But there's a moral case for that and a practical case for that. Um, secondly, skills. I'm happy to have Einstein immigration. Your question sort of presumed the idea that our skilled immigrants are, in fact, Einsteins. There's not that many Einsteins in the world. And a very, having a very high bar for skilled immigration and letting those people in not on some kind of contingent visa like this H-1B visa, but we simply let them in and they do their thing. Highly skilled people can in fact make significant contributions to the productive capacity of the United States. But when you let in enormous numbers of even skilled people, you create other kinds of problems with regard to assimilation, for instance, because skilled people are much more likely to already have a fully formed national identity. It's harder to get the kind of emotional assimilation. We have right. categories for very highly skilled people. It would be a few people, say 25,000. Right. Um, and then humanitarian, refugees, political asylum. And, you know, refugees are very costly in a whole variety of ways. I would pick 50,000 just because that's what Congress thought it was approving when it passed the 1980 Refugee Act but make sure that these are genuine, not just genuine refugees, but refugees who will never have anywhere else to go ever, um, and for whom this is the only option. And there just aren't that many people like that, quite frankly. Mark Krikorian, author of The New Case Against Immigration. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.